Sure. First of all, I'd like to say I'm not here to speak for ABS-CBN. I'm here as a journalist. Well, it's rather unfair. I think everybody spoke for their network. So don't think I'm speaking for ABS-CBN, okay? Um, for, for journalists like me, especially on TV, we're used to communicating one way. You know, you're in front of a camera, but you're speaking to millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people. So being on social media sometimes is a leap of faith. There are some journalists who are not yet, some anchors who are not yet on Twitter because it's, you know, it's hard work. I'm on air on Bandila and somebody tweets, Oji Diaz actually, ah, parang hindi pantay ang makeup ni Cez. <laughs> And you know how can you you know so you, you have to separate what you what what you pay attention to and and what you engage in and what you know you just like no but but I like Oji Diaz I'm not saying he's a bad guy anyway this is not a newscast this is a response I made to a tweet I got uh, who I think was um, one of the trolls of the anti RH groups so let me just read from what I wrote here. Uh, yeah, he, he said this, this person said this because I was not g giving equal time to uh, the anti-RH uh, advocates on Twitter, on my Twitter account. But that is not to say that what I post on social media is not bound by the ethics and rules that journalists like me adhere to. This is why I chose to disclose my bias for the reproductive health bill on Twitter. As a journalist, I felt it was the right thing to do because I used my Twitter account to correct when the um, opportunity arises, the deliberate misinformation and disinformation being spread by some members and followers of the Catholic Church. I say some, not all. As a journalist, my engagement with social media has become a valuable tool in my profession. So I suppose I can elaborate more on, you know, the overall view given my by my colleagues here. For instance, because of Twitter, I uh, managed to go to New Zealand. Let me tell you how, how it started. There was one uh, Twitter follower, uh, we were on air in Bandila, who um, wanted to get information on the quake in New Zealand. And at that time, the government was saying there were no casualties. There were no Filipino casualties. And so, you know, we have we're on air, we're, we're uh, live tweeting on Bandila. We're, we're used to that, the three of us, Julius, Karen, and I. And, you know, there's this pressure sometimes from our followers, air this, this happened now, you got to retweet it. So I engaged this person who gave me contact numbers of people who were in New Zealand, the Filipinos who were in New Zealand, and I Skyped them. And then we were able to get information about uh, what was going on there directly from, you know, it would take forever to be able to get in touch if we were go, th if, we, if we were go, uh, we were to go through the normal route of news gathering. But I was immediately able to talk to our um, countrymen in New Zealand and get um, a real-time update on the rescue efforts there. And so the news desk decided, since you had the contacts, go to New Zealand. So uh, that's that's one way that um, so the social media has been useful to me as a reporter. And also recently, while we were again um, airing, as we were airing Bandila, so many USD students, you know, were, were um, tweeting uh, pictures about Dre Marcos, the uh, latest hazing victim uh, in San Beda. Again, pressuring us to, you know, air this. It's, it happened to our uh, former classmate. And, and what I did was um, I engaged some of them. I said, you know, we, have, uh, we can't do that. We have to verify the information directly, et cetera, et cetera. But then um, the following day, I was able to make a news report because of engaging his former classmates. I got access to people who had... Um, who were close to him, which again would have taken, would have been so difficult. I, you know, I called UST, I passed through their media affairs person, and they said I had to write a letter. I went through that process, but you know, by the end of the day, if I had waited for that, um, I would never, I wouldn't get a story. But since I engaged these people, uh, these concerned citizens on on Twitter, I was able to get that story. So. Uh, Again, I, I think my colleagues have spoken about how in the recent 
calamity, social media has been a bridge between the authorities and the citizenry. So I won't, uh, well, the downside. Okay. So, you know, Bandila, we like to pride ourselves in being, like I said, you can, we can tweet real time. At the end of the show, we'll say, hey, we'll show, hey, there's this picture tweeted to us uh, by this person. He's in this province. This is the situation there. Um, so, so it's become somehow a mark of Bandila. But there was one time, you know, because of the, the urgency of the situation and you want to show people uh, the situation in certain areas so they would avoid going there. I tweeted a picture that was of Ondoy Vintage. <laughs> okay? So everybody was calling me out. Hey, that's, uh, the, that's, that's not the right picture. That's, that's, that's um, not, um, that didn't happen just today. It was from Ondoy. And so what I did was, uh, of course, call out that person who tweeted it, you know, and admitted also my mistake. So that's, that's how where it, um, as how we pointed out, that's where the protocols have to come in on how, um, you know, we as journalists have to vet what is tweeted to us. Uh, okay, let me see now. Okay, in closing, uh, I like to think of my page as a, a cess drill on channel, <laughs> if there ever was one. Um, you know, I don't tweet just my um, news coverages, but also my personal interests. Uh, those who follow me see a lot of food tweets, <laughs> but they're very popular, huh? So anyway, uh, so I like to think of my page as an intersection of me, the journalist, and me the advocate, as in um, my advocacy for the reproductive health bill. Thank you very much.